Welcome to Dream Farm. Today we're going to talk about how we established uh, an oak seedling forest from acorns. This is my favorite way of uh, addressing marginal acres on hunting land. And I know that even the, the DNRs in various states do this in some areas too to reforest locations. But there's a lot of tricks to it and I've had some failures over the years. Uh, I'm definitely counting this one as a success so far. We've been checking it now for the past uh, probably three weeks. When we first started looking, there were just a couple of little trees out of the ground, and the soil temperature then was 60 degrees, about three inches down. And uh, today we checked it again, and it's about 80, and there's tons of trees up. I'd say hopefully in the neighborhood of about 20% of the total are up. And every time we look out here, there's more. So this is the kind of the tipping point for these acorns really popping out of the ground. Seems to be somewhere, you know, 70 some degrees plus um, that really gets them fired and, and growing. So I really want to talk about this whole process uh, from start to finish because there are a lot of details here and you have to get them all right. Unfortunately, it's not like you can, you know, you're not, you're not planting your yard. Um, these acorns are a lot more fickle and there's certain ways that you have to do this to have success. So let's take a quick break and uh, hear from who is actually presenting us with the Dream Farm series and then we'll dive into the details. Dream Farm is brought to you by Whitetail Institute Food Plot Blends, the Hunt Stand Pro Whitetail App, Hoyt Archery, and RTP Outdoors. We just walked around to the other side of this ridge and the ridge, it really lays kind of north-south. So you go out on the point and the point is facing straight south and then you go around the side and then you've got a southwestern exposure. We're on the eastern side. So we've got an east exposure here and we checked the soil temperature and it was closer to 70 degrees a couple of inches down, two to three inches down, and there's in the same area where we might have seen hundreds of trees on the other side, we've only found two so far. So it really is soil temperature dependent because I know that uh, nothing else changed. You know, when we planted, how we planted, the acorns that we used, they were all the same on this side as they were on the other side. So the only variable is the soil temperature. And that's not necessarily to say that that southern or southwestern exposure is always going to be better because uh, you know, as the summer goes on, that's sure to dry out a lot quicker than this. So by the end of the summer, there may be more and better trees still surviving on this side than on the really hot side. But as far as getting them out of the ground, they're definitely popping over there. We have found a much more comfortable position, location, to make the rest of this long and tedious discord on how to grow your own oak forest. No, I'm hopefully just joking about that. It is pretty cool. And uh, I mean, we've taken a lot of joy in just watching these trees come up and checking on them every, almost every day, just to get a feel for when they're growing, how they're growing. And it was cool to have like participated in it, to have all planted them, and then to see them actually <clears throat> growing and turning into little trees is pretty cool. If you call working hard for 14 hours participating, then yeah. I like your style of participation. Yeah. <laughs> That's a participation award worthy yeah. performance. Yeah, that was that was participation, all right. Okay, so let's talk about this. It's a, the, the good thing about this is that I didn't come up with this formula. Uh, I took this from a white paper that the Iowa State Forestry Extension Office put out. There wasn't many resources available when I first started doing this. I think that was in 2006 or 7, my first project of direct seeding. And I had 22 acres and it was a, I think it was a WIP funded program back at the time, which is a government funding. And this program here was also funded through a government program. I think it was REAP. Can't remember which, which one, but um, there's another big sign up going on now for what they call EQIP. So anytime the federal government puts money into these, uh, these cover sustainability, soil quality, 
you know, they've got a lot of different names for that bucket, but uh, that's where we're getting the money from to do this. You have to put a lot of time and effort in and you'll get a cost share. So you get a percentage of it back. Where do you find those uh, currently available funding? The two places, one, uh, the NRCS office in your county. That's the Soil Conservation Office. And, uh, you know, they're a good starting point. You're ultimately going to have to have the district forester or some kind of state forester or somebody, maybe even a private forester, write a management plan. And then that gets submitted. And then once it gets approved, then you can go ahead and you'll have the cost share locked in. And you do have to show that you did it. You can't just take the money and run, which is good. Um, so that's, that's kind of the starting point is if you've got these marginal acres, and we had basically a pasture farm, and a lot of it was timber. A high percentage of this farm was timber. But some of it, and I think we've identified probably about 40-some acres that are too steep to farm, that don't have any good permanent habitat on them. They were just cool season grasses. And I've got to figure out long term how to convert these into something that creates value for our main purpose, which is a recreational property, um, really cir circling around whitetail deer and here rough grouse. We're really going to make rough grouse a priority on this farm too. Um, they were native when I was a boy. There was tons of them everywhere. I mean, there was nothing to get 15, 20 flushes in a day. And now, I mean, you'd be really lucky to get one a day. And uh, you'd have to be hunting in spots that really had an, you know, a, an identified population to even do that. So we're going to try to focus on getting the grouse back. But the deer are going to be, you know, part of that formula too. So, okay, um, I've kind of maybe taking the wind out of my own sails by saying you can get all the same information from this document. <laughs> so that's that's what I would do if I were you. Then you don't have to listen to all the rest of this. But there are some things that I've learned anecdotally that will add to that uh, that I think are worthwhile. So let's just walk through the steps. Uh, the first step is you've got to have a really good source for the seed. And I've had some seed that I've gotten over the years that wasn't good. And the stuff that we got this last time around was really good. And I've had, you know, everything in between. I think I've done four or five of these. And I've had some that failed. And almost always the reason they failed was because of the, the quality of the seed. I remember uh, when we were planting them too, you had to get them in the ground pretty soon after getting them mm -hmm. because you didn't want them to start germinating or to dry out or whatever the issue was. Yep. And you were worried that if you didn't get the acorn soon enough, they wouldn't be viable anymore. So is it kind of a time sensitive thing as well? Yeah, I think that's part of the, maybe the art of it that you might not get from that, um, that extension office white paper. But the white oak is a fall germinator and the red oaks, black oaks, you know, the oak in that family are spring germinators. And the spring germinators you don't have to worry too much about because they want to have that cold, hot, cold stratification. Mm -hmm. I mean, they they need the winter. They don't care about really being handled a certain way. But as soon as the white oak hits the ground, it's trying to germinate and put a root down. And uh, that means that, like, when you float these things to make sure the seed is viable, mm -hmm. that's what the seed collectors do. Mm -hmm. Because the ones that float, um, they're not viable. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they are. I mean, those guys know. I mean, occasionally they'll say, well, this one's got, you know, a half of a viable seed in it and it'll grow a tree. But generally, anything that floats, they throw out. Anything that sinks is the stuff that they'll sell to you. And uh, um, the white oaks now are moist. We just floated them. We put them into cool storage so that they don't really start going crazy. Uh, we keep them subdued. And then we get them into the ground, covered up and moist as soon as we take them out of that cold storage. So it's really important that you don't put them into dry ground, you know, when they're trying that hard to germinate and then have that seed dry up. So um, that's uh, that's the timing part. It has to do with the white oak family. Um, the seeds, everybody's always asking, where do I get the seed? You can collect it yourself. They make what's called a, a nut roller or a, you know, acorn basket, or I'm sure it goes by a lot of different names, but you can find these things online. You can do a, an online search and uh, all they are is look like a football 
that just rolls along. I mean, it's like a wire cage. When you roll over an acorn, the wires separate and then it goes inside and then it stays in there. Uh, so you can go to a golf course or maybe a city park or somebody's yard where it's closely mown where it's easy to roll it through there and pick up all the acorns. And I've been to golf courses before where literally it's like you can't take a step without stepping on you know 10 acorns. Mm -hmm. So you could get an awful lot of them in places like that. Uh, I've been buying mine from, from uh, seed collectors, the guys that go and do that. And it's harder to find them in your state um, than, than for me because I've got my network now. But you, you create your network by contacting as many private foresters, uh, public district foresters, anybody that has anything to do with forestry and ask them if they collect and sell acorns. And if they say no, ask them if they know somebody who does. And pretty soon you're gonna wind up with three or four people in your state that do this. Uh, I think I was paying in the neighborhood of about $45 a bushel, roughly for the red and white uh, some of the other stuff that I planted, Swamp White, I think was like $90 a bushel. Um, there were some other species that were, uh, you know, a bushel produced an awful lot of acorns because they were smaller seeds. Uh, you know, they might have been $75 a bushel. But anyway, in the end, I ended up probably somewhere in the, by the time I factored in chemical and, and labor, probably seven, $800 an acre, uh, of which... The government program paid most so that's why it's really nice to do this within that that uh, program rather than just coming out of pocket with all that uh, so you know we probably need to walk through it because not everybody wants to get the white paper so <laughs> sorry folks you're gonna have to you can you can quit right now i guess and go watch something else on youtube but go read the white paper we're gonna dive into it so you you, uh, you got your seeds coming, you spray the area, and you get a good kill. And usually it takes, you know, at least a couple of weeks to get a good kill. So you want to spray, let's say, even a month ahead of time before you're going to plant. Then you go in there with a disc and uh, open that up. Because what you want is a seed bed that once you scatter the acorns, you can disc over it again and, and bury them. And the ideal depth for an acorn is probably anywhere from just, you know, an inch to maybe three inches somewhere in that range maybe even a little bit deeper so you don't need to have like a super deep tillage but you do need to have deep enough that you can bury them otherwise what we saw was the deer they just walk along mm -hmm. and eat them you know they our deer got really good at finding these acorns on top of the ground you know back in october and mm -hmm. november well they weren't even there in october december. But yeah november december so anything on top of the ground the deer ate uh which they weren't going to probably grow anyway i mean you know there's some chance but um, so anyway, the point is, you can't just put them out, you got to bury them. And the easiest way to do that is with the disc. Uh, I know there are people who have used mechanical spreaders, but uh, we used human spreaders. <laughs> Jordan and Ethan Stubbs did all the work. Uh, we got the acorns, the next day we spread them, but we timed it so that it would be right before a rain. I didn't want the acorns you know, out there in the ground and have it be dry for two weeks. So we scheduled it when we knew a rain was coming. Uh, I went and got the acorns. We spread them and then that night it rained. So we spread, I think 13 acres of acorns in one day. And then that night, and dissed them in and that night it rained. So it was perfect timing. You know, that, that's the key. Uh, you just, you have to treat the seed as if it's gold, especially the white oak. Otherwise you just won't get any white oak uh, regeneration out of it. Well, what else? Um, I have a question. Yeah. Um, do you think that having more food sources available to the deer during the winter would it help mitigate them eating the acorns? Because it's obviously more work to go dig up an acorn than it is to eat something that's already there. Yeah, they weren't digging them up, fortunately. Yeah, they were just eating them off the top. Mm -hmm. Yep. And I watched them really careful to make sure. But do you think even if they were just, I guess, having more easily accessible food mm -hmm. still standing during the winter so maybe it would have a big impact on the success rate depending on how much food available to the deer and wildlife you have around i think it does uh, especially and more so after 
they germinate and come out of the ground, mm -hmm. I think, because they love acorns. They would mm -hmm. rather eat acorns than corn mm -hmm. or, you know, beans or whatever. Mm -hmm. I mean, so if they can find acorns, they're going to eat them, um, even if you've got other stuff. Mm -hmm. So you've got to get them buried. I guess that's the takeaway on mm -hmm. that. But where they get you is when they start browsing these small plants later. Mm -hmm. Because when you get growth that pops up, any kind of fresh new growth, the deer see that as browse. Right. And they'll eat these the tops off these trees every year when they try to grow. Uh -huh. These oak trees will try to grow a foot a year, and the deer will eat back a foot. Uh -huh. You know, and then takes it can take forever to get a tree that should be six feet tall in six years. It might be ten years before they're six feet tall. So how are you going to help prevent that from happening to these? We don't have the deer density. Ah, uh, okay. Because it actually worked in southern Iowa where the density was way higher. Right. It just took a long time. Yeah. So we had what should have been six years to establish, you know, a, a deer proof uh, oak seeding took probably 10 or 11 years in Southern Iowa because, you know, they don't get every single tree eight down every year. Right. So eventually you get some that pop ahead of them because as the root system starts to develop, they start popping up even more each year. Mm -hmm. So maybe by year seven or year eight, they're putting out, you know, 18 inches. Mm -hmm. And then eventually they get ahead of the deer, then the deer now that, that grows, mm -hmm. that central leader just takes off and then the deer can't catch it again. Um, but they eventually all got ahead of the deer. And, and uh, I think that'll happen here too pretty quick. You know, I'm hoping that with our density that we have here that these trees will actually grow a foot a year. Mm -hmm. You know, in six years, they'll be six feet tall. Mm -hmm. um, that's kind of the, the benchmark in decent soil for these oak trees, you know, 10 to 12 inches a year. And uh, you have to you have to maintain the herbicide, uh, or you know the you know the you've got to keep the the area clean from competition. I guess you've got to keep spraying. And I did only one year on the other plantings that I've done, but the district forester here asked me to do two years. So this spring I, I sprayed Pendulum and some Oust XP, and the Oust is supposed to kill stuff that's already uh, that's already popped out of the ground, and the Pendulum is supposed to keep other stuff other than trees from growing mm -hmm. that hasn't germinated yet and it looks like it's working pretty well I mean these areas are still pretty bare yeah there's not like a lot of weeds or grass I mean when you compare it to even the clover field up on top yeah uh that was disked obviously mm -hmm. this spring and that's full of random weeds and stuff like that and these yeah. slopes don't have hardly anything compared to what those look like yeah so they want you to do that for two years and uh Again, the white paper's got all that information in it. Mm -hmm. So I'm just repeating stuff that I've, I've learned that way. I've got um, another question. Yeah. We planted, I don't know, what did we figure the ballpark was? Like 250,000 acorns or something like that? Well, the breakdown was somewhere around 20 to 25,000 acorns per acre. So about one acorn for every two square feet, Okay. roughly. Um, that's about where it fell. I think we planted roughly five bushels per acre of acorns, and we had a wide variety. We had the white, mm -hmm. the red, the black. We had chinkapin. We had swamp white. We had chestnut. We had pin. Uh, the walnut. Did you say we, that? We planted some walnut, not a ton. Um, and then I think we might have had that. Might have been it for oaks, but we might have had one more. I can't remember. Um, we had just about every oak burr. Bur oak also. We had every oak that you can find in Iowa, basically. Um, the seed collector was really struggling to find enough of the red, so he started bringing me all kinds of stuff that, that sort of fell outside of the white family. And so we're gonna have a super wide variety, which is pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I guess my question is, what would you consider, or what would you expect or hope for a uh, final, these trees made it two, three years, like what percentage would you consider to be a success? I think 50% is attainable. I'd say we've got about 15 to 20% out of the ground right mm -hmm. now on those warm slopes. Mm -hmm. I think if we end up with somewhere in the 50, maybe even a little bit less than that, because you know, a, a, an oak tree that's six feet tall um, on, the thing's moving, on four square feet, uh, every four square feet, that's an awful lot of that's oak trees. Lot of oak trees yeah. Yeah. That's two feet by two feet. Yeah, that's, yeah. So, I mean, and in 20 years, mm -hmm. those are... Yeah, getting, you, gotta, you have to get a thin them. Yeah. yeah. They're not going anywhere. So, I mean, they're not going to grow. 
camera was overheating, so we had to move again. So it's like location number four. Uh, this is less comfortable again, so this is gonna have to go a lot quicker. <laughs> I missed my chair already. Yeah, we're almost done anyway. But I guess the bottom line is this is something that you can do. You just have to be really careful about the details. Um, you can't skip steps. And the white paper's got all that stuff in it. I just followed it word for word, and uh, it, it's always turned out well for me. Maybe there's a few little things that I've learned that I do differently now. The timing is super important, I think, more than anything else, is getting high quality seeds and then getting them into the ground as quickly as you can after they come out of cool storage and then right before a rain. Uh, if you do that, you're gonna have really good success with this. And uh, again, uh, every acre that you own counts. I mean, you had to pay for them all. You know, when you bought this stuff, the person you bought it from didn't say, oh, I'll just throw that one in because, you know, there's nothing you can do with it. Well, you're paying for all of it, so it might as well all be productive. And I say, by productive, it needs to either, you know, produce food or it needs to produce habitat. So that's how we look at the farm. Uh, every acre counts. So that's our, our update on the trees. We'll come back again in a few weeks and touch the subject again and just show you the final number that came up. So we'll get a real clean tally on the, the uh, actual germination rate. And I've seen in the past that sometimes you don't get these trees for a year. Like there'll be some that, especially the red oak family, that just stay in the ground for a year. Mm -hmm. and then they start popping out the next year. So just because you don't get you know, all of them this year doesn't mean you won't get a few more next year. Um, and then people have been really questioning the, the I guess the monoculture uh, nature of this type of planting. But what they don't realize is that it's not perfect. Like when we throw these out, they come up in clumps. There'll be some spots where nothing grows. I mean, there's plenty of diversity in these oak seedings. Mm -hmm. um, it's not like you're gonna get this solid stand of oak. It just doesn't turn out like that. You know, I've seen it over and over. You get, you know, some trees here, none there. So you end up with all sorts of, of uh, diversity within these plants. Because other things and plants and whatever grasses fill in those yep. gaps. That's right. Yep. Okay, well that's it for this week. Uh, we appreciate you joining us and we'll see you back here again next week for the next episode of Dream Farm. And remember to always... Dream big. <laughs>